So in the previous lecture, we presented the solution to the filtering equations for linear and Gaussian models. For these models, both the predicted and the posterior density is Gaussian, and the mean and covariance of these are given by the Kalman filter equations. Although we gave some hints in the previous lecture for why the Kalman filter equations actually make sense, in this lecture, we will more formally derive them, and we will do so from a Bayesian perspective. Before we start, however, we need to define some prerequisites and some notation. So foremost, we assume that we have a linear and Gaussian model, so the state at the current time is equal to the state at the previous time instance times this transition matrix, AK minus 1. To account for added uncertainty in the predicted state, we also have this additive noise process, Q, which is assumed to be Gaussian with zero mean and covariance QK minus 1. The observation YK is similarly described as a linear function of the state, XK, multiplied by this measurement model matrix, HK. And again, we have this uh, additive noise process R, which we again assume to be Gaussian with zero mean and covariance RK in this case. Additionally, we also need to assume that the prior state, X0, is also Gaussian with some mean and some covariance. We should also note that an equivalent way of expressing these models here is to express them on their density form, like this, where the process or motion model is defined as a density over xk, where we know the state at the previous time instance, xk minus 1. And the measurement model, or likelihood, is defined as a density over the observation yk, if we condition on the current state xk. I would encourage you to make sure that you understand that these two express exactly the same thing, just in two different ways. So, the objective of this lecture is to use these models and the assumptions that we presented here to derive analytical expressions for the predicted density. That is, the density over xk given measurements up to time k minus 1. And for the posterior density, which is then the density over xk, but now we also condition on the measurement at the current time k. So, there are many ways to derive the comma filter expressions. One possible way is to derive the comma filter equations from the filtering equations. To do this, we simply plug in the Gaussian densities that we presented in the previous slide into this, these equations and then try to solve them. So, for example, we need them to calculate this integral here and we need to solve this product here. Although it's completely possible to do so, unfortunately, this involves various matrix manipulations and it's rather tedious. So what we're going to present here is a more standard derivation where we instead make use of well-known, or at least well-known for a statistician, results regarding Gaussian distributions. Additionally, we hope that this will give you some better understanding for what's happening in the Kalman filter and help you understand a bit better the nonlinear filters that are based on the Kalman filter that we will learn later on in this course. Let's start with the prediction step. So the objective here is to compute the predicted density, and to do so, we use two assumptions. First, we assume that the posterior density from the previous time instance, so the density over x k minus 1, given measurements up to k minus 1, is a Gaussian density with this mean and this covariance. So remember that for our linear Gaussian models, all our filter densities are Gaussian, and as the Kalman filter is a recursive filter, this is a relevant assumption to make. Secondly, we assume that we have a linear and Gaussian process model like this that we presented in the previous slide. Uh, with this in mind, what we want to do is use these assumptions to calculate the mean and covariance of this density. We will base our derivation on the well-known result that if we have two independent Gaussian random variables, let's call them Z1 and Z2 in this case, a linear combination of these two variables is then also a Gaussian random variable where the mean is just a linear combination of the mean of, the, of the, these variables and the covariance can be calculated like this from the covariance of the individual Gaussian random variables. We can easily derive these expressions 
by using fundamental rules for the expectation and covariance operator that we have learned in the beginning of the course. So, as xk minus 1 and qk minus 1 are independent Gaussian random variables, we can use this result directly on our motion model to get the predicted density. So we want to calculate our predicted density, p of xk given measurements up to k minus 1, which equals a Gaussian density of xk, where the mean is given by the expected value of xk, as described by this process model, where we condition on observations up to time k minus 1. So we have a k minus 1 times the expected value of x k minus 1 given measurements up to k minus 1 which is exactly this mean here and then the expected value of q k minus 1 is just zero right so it's zero mean so we get nothing else for the covariance we again use this expression here so the covariance of xk minus 1, which is this covariance here, is then multiplied by the transition matrix on both sides. So we have ak minus 1 times pk minus 1 given k minus 1, ak minus 1 transpose, according to this formula here. And then we need to add the covariance for our process noise, qk minus 1. So that's qk minus 1. To map this to the notation that we have, we call this mean x hat k given k minus 1, and we interpret this as the estimate of x at time k given observations up to k minus 1. And similarly for the covariance, we call this p k given k minus 1, which is the covariance of x k conditioned on measurements up to k minus 1. And we see that what we calculate here is exactly what we calculate in the prediction step of the comma filter. So we have now derived the prediction step in the comma filter. Before we tackle the update step in the comma filter, we need to understand an important lemma for conditional distributions of Gaussian random variables. And it goes like this. So if x and y are two Gaussian random variables with a joint probability density function like this, so we concatenate x and y into a single vector, and that vector then is Gaussian distributed with mean mu x and mu y, which is simply the expected value of x and mu y is simply the expected value of y and that the covariance matrix of this uh, joint vector here has this structure where p of x x is the covariance of x and p y y is then the covariance of y and p x y is then the cross covariance of x and y. We denote this as the covariance of x comma y and where p y x is simply the cross covariance between y and x which is simply p x y transpose as the covariance matrix needs to be symmetric. So these need to be the transpose of each other. And this cross covariance is then related to how x and y are correlated to each other or dependent on each other. Once you note that this structure here is general and that we haven't made any other assumptions uh, than that x and y are jointly Gaussian. So given that two variables are jointly Gaussian, we can always structure its mean and covariance in this manner. So based on this, the lemma states that the conditional distribution of x given y, for example, is then also Gaussian, where the mean is given by the mean of x, but we slightly shift it compared to the prior mean of x uh, by this term here. We further see that this term here depends on the distance between the actual y and what we expect y to be, and that we weight this distance uh, 
by a ratio that is dependent on how correlated x and y are, divided by how much uncertainty we have in y. As a sanity check, we can see that if pxy is zero, so x and y are uncorrelated, we see that this term disappears and the mean is simply the same as before. So if we observe y and they are uncorrelated, it doesn't change the mean of x, which is to be expected, right? For the conditional covariance, on the other hand, again, we take the, the prior covariance of x, pxx, and then we reduce it by this factor here. And here we can make two observations. First, as with the conditional mean, if x and y are uncorrelated, so pxy is zero, this term again disappears, and the covariance of the conditional density is the same as uh, the covariance for x. So observing y and x and y are uncorrelated doesn't change the covariance of x. It doesn't give us any information on x. Second, if on the other hand x and y are correlated, the covariance of x, if we condition on y, will always be less than the covariance of x because we reduce it by this factor here and this factor here is always positive. And this also makes sense, right? As if they are correlated, after observing y, we should be less uncertain about x than before we made the observation. So in sum, the lemma states that if we have two ga jointly Gaussian random variables, the conditional density is also Gaussian with the mean and the covariance expressed like this. Perhaps you can already now see some patterns here for how we can use this lemma to prove the update step in the comma filter. But let's look at this in some more detail. So when we do the update step in the comma filter, we assume that we have already made the prediction step that we showed earlier. That is, we have computed the moments of the predicted density of xk given observations up to k minus 1, and we denote these moments as this. Additionally, uh, we observe a measurement y at time k, which is related to the state at time k through this linear measurement model. So here we have two Gaussian random variables, and in order to see that they are jointly Gaussian, it is convenient that we use the measurement model and rewrite it to express the joint random variable x, y. So we have this joint variable x, k, y, k, which we want to express as something times x, k plus something times r, k. So we want to write it on this form here. And in order for this to hold true, we see that, okay, we need to have the identity matrix here, and we need to have a zero here, and this needs to be HK, and this needs to be the identity matrix. So now we see that this equation holds true, right? So XK is equal to XK plus zero times RK, and YK is equal to HK XK plus RK which is what we see here, right? So now that we have written it on this form, it actually follows directly that we can write the joint distribution of x, k, y, k, condition on all the measurements up to k minus one as this Gaussian density. And it's perhaps useful to map this back to the notation that we used in the lemma on the previous slide. So we have the expected value of x here, so this was, we call this mu x, and this is then mu y. This we called p x x, and this whole expression here, we call that p y y, and this was then the cross covariance between x and y, and this here was then the cross covariance between y and x, which is actually equal to the cross covariance between x and y, transposed. Now, if we use the lemma on conditional Gaussian densities, we can express the posterior density as this Gaussian density where the posterior mean, x hat k given k, is equal to... So if you use the lemma on the previous slide, we see that we can form this as mu x plus pxy times pyy inverse times y minus mu y. So simply using the lemma on the previous slide, we see that we can formulate the posterior mean as this expression here. And if we now 
identify what these are from what we see here, we see that this is equal to x hat k given k minus 1 plus pxy is this expression here, pk given k minus 1, and hk transpose. And then pyy is this expression here. Remember from the previous uh, lecture, we actually call this sk as the innovation covariance. So to simplify things, we will call it sk in this equations. So we have sk inverse times y is yk in this case, minus the expected value of yk given observations up to k minus 1, which is given here, hk times x hat k given k minus 1. So if we look at this, we can see that this here, this difference here, is what we call the innovation in the previous lecture. And this factor here in front of it is what we call the Kalman gain. So this is actually equal to the Kalman gain times the innovation. And this is exactly how the updated mean is calculated in the Kalman filter. So how about the posterior covariance? So again, if we use the lemma, we see that our posterior covariance can be written as pxx minus cross covariance x and y times pyy inverse times pyx. And pyx, we see that this is just the transpose of p x, y, so we exchange it like this. So if we identify what things are here, so pxx is just a predicted covariance, and then pxy is this expression here, and pyy is just sk, so sk inverse, and then pxy transpose is just this expression here, but transposed. So now if we introduce a small little trick saying that sk times sk inverse, so this product here is simply the identity matrix, right? So we can insert this into our uh, equation here without changing anything. So if we rewrite this as and then insert this identity matrix here in the middle which we can take the transpose of as it's a symmetric matrix we get the following expression. And if we look at this, we can see that this factor here is actually the Kalman gain. And this factor here is simply the Kalman gain transposed. So with this, we have that the updated covariance matrix is simply the predicted covariance minus the Kalman gain times the innovation covariance times the comma gain transpose, which is also exactly how we presented it in the previous lecture. So now we have also derived the update step of the comma filter. We have now derived the comma filter using some well-known results regarding Gaussian densities. And you might wonder, so why is this important? Well, from my perspective, I think it's important from at least two aspects. First, being able to derive the comma filter offers some intuition into what the comma filter actually does. And secondly, by being able to derive the comma filter, we can figure out how we need to adapt equations if the underlying assumptions change slightly. This could, for example, be uh, if we no longer have zero mean process and measurement noise. How do we then need to adapt these equations in order to fit this slightly different model? 
We end this lecture with a self-assessment question where you can try out your intuition regarding correlation and the distribution of random variables.